Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I am Jim Henry here with my good friend and co-host Sal LaFrary. Today's topic is increasing, ever-increasing cyber threats are driving compliance requirements beyond federal gov business into mainstream commercial markets. So, Sal, this is an interesting trend, and uh, I think it's going to be more than interesting. I think it's going to have ramifications on all the stakeholders on the on the commercial side that are not used to um, to this level of uh, regulated uh, markets and compliance, and it's going to impact end users, manufacturers, consultants, and integrators. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's uh, you know you, you you're going to hear when it hits the commercial side. I think we're going to see a whole lot of kicking and screaming. Right? We we saw that with uh, all the SOX legislation, right? With Sarbanes Oxley and everybody. Oh God, here we go with more requirements. But I think. You know, when you start looking at cyber and you look at the, the threats that are really out there, I think, one, we need to get a real good understanding of it. I think the average person, to them, cyber threats basically is identity theft, and they don't understand the ramifications of intellectual property theft or all of the other, you know, all the R&D that's, that's potentially, you know, problematic for them. Uh, and I think, you know, we're going to need to get those compliance requirements pushed down from the federal level down, you know, down to the, down to the commercial level. And I think as things that we've been talking about, and you know, in other shows, we really need to have that capability, that level set, where when you establish compliance, then all of a sudden now you 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 got a lot more playing level playing field. People will have to follow along with regulations and, and, to, and to be able to comply and the implications of the insurance industry that follow suit on that. So I think it's, uh, it's a pretty broad ranging topic, but uh, I'm actually uh, really interested to hear our guest and see what uh, his thoughts are. Well, we are extremely fortunate uh, to have as our guest today, Andrew Lanning. He's the co-founder of Integrated Security Technology or IST out in the beautiful state of Hawaii. Um, Andrew uh, brings a unique perspective to this conversation. Not only does he have 22 years uh, in the business after having founded uh, IST uh, as a security systems integrator, he also has the benefit of uh, having a lot of business out in the federal gov DOD market and has seen the evolution of uh, of these compliance requirements that were really triggered by the cyber threats uh, that first, uh, you know, veered their ugly heads, uh, you know, maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago now. And, uh, and because he is also on the commercial side, can, can kind of uh, be preparing his company for, for that then moving into the, into the commercial markets. Plus, Andrew has uh, his own podcast series uh, that he is the host of called Security Matters out at uh, Think Tech Hawaii. So he, he brings just a wealth of uh, knowledge uh, and, uh, and input to this, uh, to this podcast. Welcome, yeah. Andrew. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Sal, Jim, it's good to be on with you today. Uh, hopefully, we can um, shed a little light for our listeners on the kind of maybe the history of the thing and, you know, why, why we're where we are today and, you know, why the government stepped in. You know, it's uh, it's great to have you on Zoom joining us from Hawaii, but I'm really trying to talk Jim into the fact that, you know, when we come out to see you and do your show, that we really need to be in studio. So uh, so you got to work with me on this one. <laughs> All right. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> so to start off the, the first, first segment, of course, we could go for weeks on this one. What are the threats? So, um, you know, since you were one of the uh, early uh, uh, adopters of uh, understanding this, uh, this was going to be the wave of the future and, and really have been a driving force within, uh, within the industry, you know, to bring awareness, uh, you know, to preparing for cyber threats and how do we need to be, uh, you know, preparing our companies to be able to, uh, you know, to deal with this. Maybe you can uh, go through the, uh, the early threat series that we saw, you know, 10, 15 years ago and, and how that now has uh, been uh, exacerbated by, uh, you know, the new uh, work from home requirements, you know, during COVID. Hmm. Well, I blame all this on Bill Bozeman at PSA Security <laughs> Network, just so we're clear. Um, him and my wife got together and Balin told me to head up, you know, this this cyber committee because he was he was kind of looking at our industry 
you know, the system integrator side of the business saying, hey, our people have zero awareness. And um, so I took on that committee and we started to, to dig in. And, and at that time, it was, it was a simple little lift, right? We're looking at people, processes, and our products. And we realized very rapidly that in our industry, we didn't have a lot of control over products. And we'll, I think, get into that maybe in session two. So uh, processes was something we could work on and people was something we could work on. So we polled a large group of integrators that were, I think, you know, in my opinion, some of the leading integrators from across the country. And um, at that time, le- less than two or three percent had any real awareness of just the top ten questions that you would ask. Um, you know, do, do you use? Do you know what multi-factor authentication is? Do you know what ransomware is? And, and the level of knowledge was just nearly zero. That a uh, sort of a wake-up call for the direction that we could take the industry. Now, at the same time, and this was 2015. So at the same time, government had been looking at this for a very long time. Um, in government contracting, we've had the FAR clause for its, uh, its, its FAR as federal acquisition regulations. I don't want to get out crazy with the uh, acronyms um, for our audience who may not be um, you know, in, in, in kind of immersed in this world. But in in the federal acquisition requirements, there's a been a clause there since 2007 and eight, and it's called basic safeguarding of covered contractor information, uh, information systems, and these are just the things that you're supposed to do, like like limiting system access, which means you like have a log on a password and managing those policies, uh, verified and limit internal networking connections to devices, right? So this means you're you're monitoring and aware of the devices on your network. And, and on a very, very straightforward types of things that, that you would think, wow, I have an information system. It's got important information on it. Of course, I'm doing these things. When we polled the owners of these companies, they had no clue. And so government had begun to recognize the industry itself. And this includes R&D at, going on at universities, um, had been leaking information. Um, had actually, that's that's the wrong way to say it. Criminals had been exfiltrating information from these organizations because they really lacked the protections um, that were needed. And in some part, I would say that they weren't even implementing these basic safeguarding requirements that had been written in the FAR since 0708. And so that that history showed up in a few weapon systems, things that were really emulating stuff that we had built, um, including uh, aircraft systems. And so it was, it was really evident at that point that the, our competitors were taking information that we spent a lot of money to design, to test, to build out, to test, to build a, you know, a very expensive process. And they, they skipped all those decades of, of cost to rapidly get to the same place that we were. And that raised the DOD's um, head. So in the DOD, just um, also to kind of step step back a little bit, we have had what's called the National Industrial Security Program for many years. I don't even know the first iteration of the NISP, actually. But the um, NISP is uh, a large set of security controls derived from the National uh, Information uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, I'm sorry, 800-53, which has been, has been around for 20 years. These controls, and there are, I think, 1,800 and something of them at this time, a very broad list of security control wrapped around a network. Some, you know, some of what I talked about, the basic safeguarding controls are a subset of this larger set. This larger set is aimed at government agencies and the handling of the information systems and information within the systems that they have. Um, and it's very, very related. And it was also flowed into their DOD contractors and government subcontractors who handle classified and above. So when we talk about classified, uh, top secret, top secret NATO, there, there's a lot of level. And this is, there's a long history of managing and working the NISP and actors of these systems and, and that work within these systems and with, with these control sets are very good. And they're those who of that world, Raytheon and Lockheed and uh, GM, and all, they all contribute to the the, the military, uh, indu- the defense industrial base. Is a lot of the work that occurs prior to the you know contracting for an aircraft, right? 
all that development work is done by a lot of their subcontractors. And a lot of that work's done in really silos. I might be working on some, just as an example, some tensioning of some airframe component, right? Unrelated to the entire aircraft. I'm just testing stress levels of some material. But if you combine that with the guys, steal, steal some of that information and steal some information from the guys that actually are designing the airframe or something like that, and you start to put this information together from all these subcontractors, you can sort of figure out what kind of aircraft I'm building and what kind of tolerances it'll have and things like that. And this is where a lot of this leaking information was happening was below the NISP. So this is in this area that is unclassified. So it hasn't it hasn't been deemed to be of the, enough risk to be considered classified information yet. So below that, we have what's called this controlled unclassified information. And if I'm going in the right direction, I'll keep going. <laughs> you're you're doing just fine. Um, and and for the for the listeners again, we are. We are only a day after um, SIAS, if I pronounce that right, has come through here, and you know I think we've got uh, some of the ramifications of the, uh, you know, of the networks uh, playing a little havoc with us here. But fortunately, we have power. But I think the gist of of what you presented there for the backbone of NIST and and how that's really at the, you know, at the at the core of what's now you know being driven out into our into our industry and eventually to the commercial side will come. So yes, please continue, Andrew. Sure. So the 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 DOD, you know, recognized that hey, we've got this area of concern under underneath our our National Industrial Security Program members, and you know, h- how do we how do we deal with that? How do we how do we work on them? How do we help them bring cyber hygiene uh, into their operations? You know, without crippling them, as a, as many of them are, are very small businesses. We have three hundred thousand defense industrial base contractors, just as an example, and that's just in the defense industrial base. Remember, we do have 16 sectors in the National Industrial or National Infrastructure Protection Program, the NIP sectors. That would include healthcare sector, dams, water and wastewater, um, chemical sector, all, all those other major industries that you would think of. So, you know, we haven't really transitioned in this discussion yet outside of the defense industrial base. But they the government um, started looking at this and 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 realized that you know contractors hadn't weren't really paying attention to these basic safeguarding controls, um, so they started to ratchet that program up and said, "Well, what can we do?" And so they wanted to let the subcontractors self attest that they were meeting those standards, which they were supposed to have been meeting since seven oh seven oh eight. So the government, you know, had sort of baked this assurance into your contract, but really didn't have a way to audit it. And, you know, if you think if we're addressing, you know, C-suite folks here today and, you know, they want to know, you know, what's going on on their networks, what's going on with the systems that they operate. You know, if I if I told them that their conference room phones were all being recorded, I wonder how secure they would feel talking about the planning and strategies that they have uh, to, you know, take market share from their competitors, for example, you know, in, in those rooms. So that's an example of information that to them might be. They might understand how valuable that information could be if it was put in the wrong hands. And from the government's position, obviously, we're trying to protect information that protects the nation. And so uh, the fact that these contractors weren't really making an effort, um, this this SSP um, security system plan that they had us uh, self-attest to that we were compliant with was a, a good leap. And it was also a subset of that NIST 853 that I mentioned earlier. It is a subset called 800 And they asked, they, they started to, they came, this came out in 2016. And they were going to roll this program out and have us be compliant. Well, small business screen one freaked out. And everyone talks about implementing cybersecurity, raising their cyber hygiene levels, creating higher levels of assurance, minimizing risk. And, and it's real easy to talk about. And it's actually really easy to read and to understand. The doing of it takes time. It's expensive. And the other side of that coin is that once you put a lot of controls in place, those are really just a snapshot in time. So in the next day, there could be another vulnerability that you need to mitigate, another zero day things people hear about. These are things that were not known prior to today, something that occurs tomorrow. Some vulnerability gets discovered. Perhaps it needs a hardware change. Perhaps it needs a software change to fix it. But the manufacturers you know, get notified and then they go to work on it. Meanwhile, you, everybody else has to mitigate that, bit of build, that vulnerability until it gets fixed. So we took 
18171 and um they started to roll it out and it's very rapidly rolled rolled backwards and we've lived with the um self attested sort of um SSP until now that is still currently active if you have the DFARS clause uh DFARS is the defense federal acquisition regulations clause in your contracts which most of us do um you are supposed to self attest that you are compliant with the um the 800-171-1 controls uh, I like 800-171-A, i think they're calling them go ahead let me just jump in real quick it, sure quick question what happens if you don't do it is there any teeth to the compliance for self attestation so for self yes, yeah. we there have definitely been i think as of now three lawsuits uh fair trade act lawsuits that have been found against the contractor for uh, attesting that they're in compliance, but in fact, the theft that occurred of informa- government information from their system demonstrated that they were not. But that's su- that's um, subsequent to a, to a breach, correct? Yes, and that's you know that's it's again difficult. Attribution can be difficult, right? To to understand. So when we dis- when we say definitely this was stolen by some country, right? Or exa- for example, that that attribution of that work can be difficult. It's we can find that some that information's been exfiltrated and say, wow, you had your firewall wide open. Of course they were able to take this information. You weren't doing this basic safeguarding control on your firewall, as an example. So that makes the contractor guilty. Who did the work, that attribution piece can be quite difficult. And that's typically left to uh, groups at NSA and, and DHS and folks like that, they have a whole you know intelligence team that's constantly working on attribution to let us know, know sort of uh, what the signatures are, the types of attacks that are occurring against our networks. Um, there are certain countries that are very ample that are they're stealing money because they don't have any. So most of the attacks are banking systems, uh, that country. Um, other countries are trying to sow disinformation, um, divisiveness within our, our communities, right, uh, to sort of weaken our, our nation. With so those interests are um, also specific types of attacks and uh, different types of networks. So, and then, you know, countries that are trying to get our, our national defense information and, you know, that people hire people. It's not always the country. It's also there's folks for hire that do this type of work. So, well. so the bottom line is um, the threats. We, go ahead. The bottom line is the uh, you know the threats are serious, the consequences are serious. Uh, Self attestation was a um, you know a, a first effort you know in, uh, with with, with good intention, but it didn't work. So that kind of teases us up where we're going to go in segment two, where we're going to talk about specific uh, you know compliance requirements and and some teeth to ensure that uh, you know in the immortal words of Ronald Reagan, you know trust but verify. So. Uh, Before that, we'll just take a little break here. Um, You are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal LaFrary. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or more of us or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So segment two, Andrew, compliance requirements. Uh, Now we really start to get some teeth here. So uh, what did you see first uh, come onto the scene here? And and how is that now progressing to where we we may be seeing that over on the commercial side? We mentioned in segment one how we the the DOD sort of pulled back that um, 800-171 requirement. The idea of how to implement it was what? sort of came under fire. What's what's going to be the best practice? What was developed um, since that time out of the undersecretary for the Department of Defense, uh, Ellen Lord, uh, she went at this from a, a um, a, an auditing perspective. So they, they said, what kind of program could we develop that we could audit the actors with? Um, and recognizing that that's, again, 300,000 contractors, so a really large undertaking. But to their credit, this program has accelerated quite rapidly, and it is now formalized as the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Program. An advisory board was set up, the CMMC-AB, 
And they have been diligently this year uh, building the curriculum, building the testing standards, building the sort of entities that will operate this um, so that there are companies that can be established that get people certified so that the company can then be certified that their personnel are capable of doing these audits. Um, the government has rolled out what's called a Pathfinder program against some initial contracts where it's kind of a, okay, let's go, we'll take some experts and we'll watch how you do your audit to make sure you're doing your audit properly. And they're, they're walking through as we speak those auditing processes to make sure that they're you know, fairly leveled at all the um, companies that they have to do them for. And, you know, we want obviously a a fair playing ground for everyone. There's going to be, unfortunately, lawyers are already kind of chomping at the bit talking about how to protest your interpretation of how I've implemented my control and whether it meets the actual requirement or not and all those types of things. There's a lot on the line. I I should mention the cybersecurity maturity model certification has five levels. Level one is basically akin to that same FAR requirement that we talked about earlier. So the amount of controls in it at level one basically match up to that initial federal acquisition requirement that we've had since 07, 08. So there's not a a, a big leap there if you've already been doing everything that you're supposed to do. Level three, level two is kind of a training ground for level three. So level three is sort of the next actual level that people would aspire to. And that's the next level that they'll audit at. Level three takes uh, uh, adds another, I think, 20-something controls, 24 controls, something like that. And then level four and five are, are quite a bit higher, quite a bit more rigorous. The issue sort of that we have is that many uh, folks are, 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 I shouldn't say that, a lot of people do their IT in-house, especially at smaller levels. Maybe they're still running their own exchange server, they're running their own network. Even, you know, companies with, you know, 20 offices across the country have their own IT. So, their methods for doing these mitigations could differ from larger shops who are primarily sort of maybe doing, using cloud-based services. One of the interesting things about the CMMC certification is it's a pre-bid certification. So in other words, if, if you want to bid on this contract, you have to already be audited at, a cert, at the level that the contract requires, which will be called out in the contract. And I um, will talk about this a little bit later, but this is the kind of model that I think business could benefit from for querying its its supply chain in the future. After you are awarded, right? So you bid, you win. Now you get your contract. And of course, that Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Clause is in there. That clause has some slightly different teeth in it for backups, for example, at level three, you also need to make sure, let's say, for example, you're using a, a, a cloud environment like Azure or Google or AWS. Um, the folks that work on your environment have to be American citizens, uh, things like that. So there's some other requirements once it's awarded that get layered on top of that initial audit capacity that you showed that you had. Um, and, that, and those raise that compliance level. And they also raise the cost. We should talk about cost, I think, because it, it may inform sort of the, the C-suite out there in the world of how the government's approaching this. The government, of course, it's taxpayer dollars, but they are going to pay for that line item in the contract that requires you to be, for example, at CMMC level three. And this was kind of the pushback we saw from the early on from the SSP and self-attestation, because why would you spend it um, that they that it's valuable enough to them to pay for it and to assure that you have done these things. Now, I think, you know, compliance is an easier lift for everyone. Um, I can assure you that companies, even at my level, to move into CMMC level three in a cloud environment, this is a a six-figure investment that we're going to have to make. Along with uh, higher operating costs uh, for that environment, you know, from now through the future. What we haven't yet seen is how much of that will be reimbursable. How will it be reimbursed? Is it just GNA uh, overhead and what will be allowable? So there is a, a difference in cost. I'm already in a, in a Microsoft environment. Like we all already have an Office 365 license, for example. But when you move into a, a level three environment, for example, in FedRAMP, uh, what's called GCC High, that Office 365 license costs more. So we've got that cost. The operating environment itself is similar but it's the setup time, the moving in, all the things that you're going to have to have consultants help you with if you don't have in-house staff that can do these things. Uh, It's quite a large 
uh, to get there. Um, I don't know how, uh, I don't really know how smaller shops can get there without help from a manual service provider of some type that's working in this area. The, um, look back down the supply chain, even government couldn't bite off, you know, 300,000 contractors and the cost of that, right? So what they've done is they said, all right, these contracts are coming up this year. So how many subcontract, how prime and subcontractors work on these certain contracts? And that's about 7,500 contractors and subcontractors that we're going to try to certify uh, according to CMMC, varying levels between now and, you know, as the contracts start to get issued. Um, they did waive the um, pre-bid requirement for the CMMC certification just because this is all going so quickly. So as it as we talk today, you would have to be, you have to attest that you can be CMMC 3, for example, certified, which is what they say that's what the bid requires by the time the contract's awarded. So that could cause some additional, let's say you plan to do it, you think you're going to get audited, and then you fail your audit. You know, I don't know. The government's bigger concern, and I think all businesses should be concerned about this, is losing their supply chain. So for DOD, we have to support the warfighter mission, right? That is the number one goal. So if we start losing supply chain members who've been supplying services that are required, and we don't have other people stood up ready to take that work, we're going to be left with a gap that perhaps you know cannot be fulfilled quickly, cannot be fulfilled at all. And if that leaves the warfighter vulnerable, we haven't done our job. Andrew, let me so ask you this. A, go ahead. Let me ask you this. The in early and early on, when uh, after I had retired from government service, I was doing consulting, and we were doing work for the Department of Defense and the Department of Justice. And the what wound up happening in a lot of those contracts was that. There was no way that the smaller guys could compete for those contracts. And a lot of times those contracts were issued to companies like Boeing or, you know, the major defense contractors, and then they got subbed out. So with respect to all of the requirements that you're talking about is sort of smaller companies that trying to, you know, if they were to try to get up to that level, if I'm understanding this correctly, you know, you, you, you're talking about a six-figure investment and a whole lot of time and effort to get into it. Is this something that's that one would be able to work under a major contractor who has all of that already in place? And and saying it maybe in a different way, uh, some of these major contractors may have some real uh, go-to smaller contractors that have been part of their uh, team. Uh, do you see also those uh, those large contractors providing that kind of uh, shepherding of their favorite subs to try and help them stay compliant so they can still use them as subcontractors on these projects? 100%. It's a great question. And, and, the, and, it's a, and there's a, a point made here that we should look at. The, the supply chain risk management effort, and, and we'll get into that a little bit, hopefully, in this sector, the next one, definitely requires that you monitor the, the information that you flow down. So the idea of limiting what you're flowing down to a subcontractor to only what they need, right, which, which helps mitigate the risk of what could be taken from them. But um, even at my level, I have subcontractors who will never get here. They'll never get there. They don't have the first IT thread. These are electricians that we use um, and other types of contractors on, on that, that come to do projects for us uh, for the DOD. So what I have to do is provide a seat for them in my environment in order to share information with them. So I have to now carry some extra licenses, right, in my environment so that I can very quickly allow them in. Uh, and this can extend, you know, with, with these services, we extend all the way down to monitoring the, the mailbox on their phone, for example, right, so that they can't forward information through that email account and things like that. We do, there's, data, there's, a, there's a requirement called data loss prevention where you've marked the information that you have in your system. It could be, you know, you have it in PII, right? You have uh, routing numbers and account numbers and things like that in PII. You have social security numbers, in, or I'm sorry, PCI. And then, you know, in, in PII, you have uh, social security numbers. So you're tagging all that kind of information in your system so that you know where it's at, you know where it's going, and you can stop it if it tries to leave your environment. So, yes, the big guys who, again, remember, we're all most for the most part already have that whole NIST program well above the CMMC program. The CMMC program for them is actually a, quite a simple lift, just getting used to providing those environments and letting letting people into the environment, you know, into the piece of the environment they need to be in, but not have access to other places in the environment. That's a little bit more of their um, sort of user management kind of headache. But I think that those guys are 
their bigger challenge is identifying how many of those contractors they have, how far down that supply chain goes. You know, you go to the tier two guy and he's got four tier tier three guys working for him and they've got, you know, each have five tier five guys working for them. So, you know, that flow down piece is where this, um, it gets a little messy. And um, I, I can share with you that in this recent stars, a, a large GSA contract. So GSA, the general services agency is outside of DOD. So this, we're not talking DOD anymore. The stars three is a big contract. It's multi-year um, $50 billion, right? It's, it's just come up for renewal. So all the applications are going in. It had an entire write-up for your roadmap to CMC, CMMC, your level of compliance you were going to require. It had to be very thorough. And in addition, there was an entire area for uh, the NIST 800-161, which is the supply chain risk management controls. I have never seen that in a contract in DOD much. Now, I'm sure, actually, because I don't manufacture weapon systems, I'm sure it exists, but we haven't seen it in a broad, open federal government contract at all with GSA. That would certainly seem to be the real signal that once these types of requirements and and compliance requirements have moved from uh, traditional FedGov and, and, you know, for, for DOD into GSA procurement, that really is the step in the direction of this becoming mainstream to to commercial markets, and I think is really what warrants, uh, you know, us focusing on this uh, for this, uh, you know, for this show, which is, is mostly sea level, you know, sea level management, you know, from the from the commercial side. But uh, you know, it's it, often the DOD and DOD markets have provided for us over the years kind of a view into the technology that's going to be coming and eventually making itself mainstream. You know, in commercial markets now, it's kind of paving the way for for policies and procedures uh, making their way yeah. into commercial markets. I think I think one hundred percent. And you you really don't have to look any further than the, uh, the the National Defense Authorization Act, right? The NDAA, um, who now basically outlawed um, the sale of certain equipment from certain countries to the government. Um, and Part B, they have eight ninety nine Part B of that act. Uh, which goes into effect actually in a few days here, I think the 13th of August, you cannot use those products in your operating environment if you sell things to the government or if you work for the government. So a lot more constraint there than we've ever seen. And that that shoots, the, you know, that's a fire, a shot right across the bow of all commercial business that supplies services or equipment to the government. Well, I think that's a, Great place to uh, wrap up segment two and really tease us up for for the third segment on the ramifications of this uh, evolution. Uh, I'd remind everybody who are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal LaFrary. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak, at a, an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Segment three, this is really where the rubber meets the road for the listening audience. You know, the ramifications for all the stakeholders in the industry and, uh, you know, on, on the commercial side. And that includes the consultants, the manufacturers, the integrators, and absolutely the end users, you know, need to be, need to be aware of this, of the what and the why and also the how. So, you know, on the integrator side, uh, Andrew, I know, you know, you're kind of helped out on the, on the, on the DOD business. Because the government is actually paying for the level of uh, compliance uh, that they're requiring on certain projects. On the commercial side, it, cost is a four-letter word <laughs> you know, for, for end <laughs> users that are buying security systems. So I think that uh, I think there is a, a means by which to, um, to live with that without actually just hanging uh, you know, a, a surtax on, on, on the cost of projects. And I think it comes down to uh, just enforcing the compliance in the candidates, you know, that are chosen for projects on the supply side and the integrator side. I think integrators have shown in the past that if they can be shown an ROI for making an investment, whether it's training and certification for platform, for product platforms or what have you, they've made that in the past 
because specs come out from consultants that require you know, those certifications from those manufacturers and for good reason, because the integrators need to be, you know, adept on the on the systems that they're deploying and, and, and commissioning. Uh, the same goes here for adhering to these kinds of uh, cyber hygienes. If, uh, if the candidacy for integrators and manufacturers on design projects that are coming out from consultants, you know, that understand it's in the end user's, you know, best interest or even more, they might have to be complying with actual regulations that move into our market. Those investments will be made by the manufacturers and the integrators, but, you know, uh, only as long as they see that, that the ROI will be there because those that do not comply will eventually be weeded out of the ecosystem. Uh, is that what you, uh, you share that view? That is 100%. I compliance going forward. And you know, I'm I'm probably a little accelerated in my viewpoint of how quickly people should be getting there, but I view it as a competitive advantage. I'm hoping, I I in fact I just I would I'm betting you might say that many, many, many of our ecosystem partners that have been competing are gonna be gone because they failed to move quickly. This compliance, just at CMMC level stuff, is is a six to nine month lift. No one's going to do it any quicker. Then you got to get in line to get audited. Imagine being behind 100,000 people that need to be audited. You could be four years away from getting your next contract. So if you're not ready ready already, you're slowly losing ground to those of us who are. I would say that. I think there's a, an important thing that, that you brought up, and, and this is uh, continuous monitoring, continuous improvement. Uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology has um, another document. It's called 800-137. And I, I believe it's really informative for C-suite, for businesses to take a look at what the government's doing on that side, along with the 800 supply chain risk management stuff. Government does this really well. They've been doing it a really long time. And everybody likes to joke about government. But government's really big. And, and they've really written standards. And by the way, NIST isn't really government. NIST is the Department of Commerce. And I don't know if people are aware of why they operate that way. That allows them to operate within academia to help develop all these standards that they do. Now they just develop the standard, whether it gets adopted by this organization or that one doesn't really matter, but it's really good work. Ron Ross and all the teams there are fantastic. If you don't like picking this type of information up and, and getting through it, because it, it, some people for you know C-suite guys want a bigger picture, I would advise you to take a look at the etiology of this comes from a book or a paper called Deliver Uncompromised. You can download that for free. This is uh, maybe four to five years old at this point, but this was the look at the supply chain problems and, and what we need to do to work on them. And a far more recent document, there's an executive summary available and you can download the entire document that came from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. That report, you can get it at solarium.com, S-O-L-A-R-I-U-M, or .gov, I'm sorry, solarium.gov, really lays out for you the future of what we're going to do to promote national resilience, to reshape the cyber ecosystem. So, there's work, and there's an entire chapter on how to operationalize cybersecurity collaboration with the private sector, right? So there's, this is not being left to only government. The, the Department of Homeland Security helped work on this program. They have cited it, and, they, and they've also cited CMMC. So what, from my perspective of watching this develop, what we're going to see next is a push of a CMMC program. Whether it's CMMC or not, it will be CMMC-like. To me, why would you want a supplier in, let's just say, uh, the DOD sector with a rating of some type, let's just say CMMC level three, and now he also goes to work in the healthcare sector with similar requirements, but he's got some other grade. Now I have to map those across. What you'd really like to see across all 16 sectors is CMMC level one, CMMC level three, CMMC level four, whatever it may be, so that I know I've got that level of assurance in those providers regardless of what sector they're working in. And many of them work across sector, by the way. So I, I think it only makes sense from a cost perspective that government will adopt CMMC, DHS. Will start, DHS has started to cite the CMMC itself. Everyone's just trying to make sure it succeeds, you know, because they're going so quickly. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, before they, they, they bite off completely. And, there, and I, I should say, you know, there's, there's skepticism for programs like this because of the speed, because of the cost. Uh, the Senate Armed Service Committee wants to review the CMMC from a cost perspective, if you think, and, and you know, C-suite should do this as well. If you think about imposing cybersecurity costs uh, for some type of um, 
a monitoring or some type of um, management or some type of resilience or requirement down your supply chain, well, ultimately that cost is going to roll back up to you. So the Senate Armed Service Committee, let's say they budgeted $2 trillion. Now we're going to have a, let's say there's a 10% raise on that to do all this cyber CMMC stuff. Well, they'd like to know about that and what are they going to get for it? And, and how are they going to make sure that they actually get what they've asked for and what they're paying for and things like that? So it affects budgeting cycles. And, and that's, that's the thing for business that they need to look at. You know, we saw this in our industry years ago. We brought UL in, UL, uh, the, uh, United Laboratories who developed standards like this for many, many things. They've been with us for years. I think they're 180 years old now or something. And they developed the cyber assurance program, right? Uh, and, and specifically started talking to the security industry folks. And this is our manufacturers. This is where we didn't have, us as integrators, didn't have a lot of visibility on product, the software that's being put in there, uh, the, the firmware, how, the assurance that that stuff's not out of floating around on the internet as well, being manipulated before it gets loaded into products, all that type of stuff. And our, our manufacturers just couldn't, you know, there's no way they could afford the cost of doing that properly. And we found out so many of them weren't. I mean, it was really shocking. So um, to date, we've had a few that have, you know, been through this program. And so there's starting to be more adoption. But industry has to look at this and understand that, that this is where we're going. So whether your roadmap says, you know, we want to be, you know, for example, UL CAP program uh, uh, provider. Um, you know, you, you want to get a roadmap for assurance down your supply chain. Once you've got your own built out, what are you doing to monitor your thing? And then once it's built and you got day one, as we back in segment, how are you going to continuously improve that? What methodology you're going to implement? How are you going to methodologies? Cybersecure has this whole you got policy right at the at the beginning. You've got the procedure that addresses the policy. That's Sort of like your implementation. And then once you've got an implementation, you know, can you automate it? Can you monitor? It? Can you report upon it? And these are the types of requirements that we have for all of these controls that I'm talking about. And this is, you know, what the government's going to be looking for. This is what industry should be looking for. Look at the healthcare sector who's been really, really, you know, uh, taken advantage of and not necessarily by its supply chain. Perhaps in some instances it was supply chain. Mostly it's people who are being, um, you know, coerced uh, or being fooled and then, you know, opening up ransomware and things like that in the environment. But as we get more tools to help us with those bad actors um, or those negligent actors, uh, you may call them, ultimately we're going to need product. And the product assurance piece is, I think, a, a larger lift uh, out there. And that, that's sort of what DOD is going at if you look at the entire approach that they're taking to, you know, having systems um, and services delivered uncompromised into the DOD. And FedGov is adopting that right behind them with this STARS-3 stuff that we're seeing in GSA. DHS is citing the Cyber Solarium report, which will be all sectors. So that's that's everyone that we work for, including municipal uh, facilities, right? So that's a, that's a separate sector inside the NIP, uh, the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. So I, to me, the writing is completely on the wall. Um, if you if you're not road mapping, you know cyber hygiene. If you're not putting spin to that, and you're in commercial business, private sector industry, um, and not increasing that, you, you're really not paying attention to what's going on. You can query your markets, you can query your customers. I believe that we're first going to see it in contracting clauses inside the commercial, the private sector. Um, you're going to start to see hospitals, banks, um, energy. Uh, sectors, um, water sectors, in their contracting requirements that they ask you, they're going to start to emulate this type of, of information. They may even ask you, do you have a CMMC roadmap plan? Do you work for DOD? If you do, could you share your, your security plan with us? You know, I think we see it contractually before we see it. And, they may, and are they a two-year rollout, a five-year rollout? Uh, next year rollout, I don't know. I mean, I've already experienced cybersecurity requirements in our financial sector and in our uh, healthcare sector work in the contracts themselves. I, th I think one of the drivers on that's going to wind up being, as we wrap up, we have uh, about a minute left, but uh, I think one of the drivers on that is going to be insurance because <laughs> that's always something that hits the pocketbook. And ultimately, you know, you, when you're looking at risk management, looking at you know liability policies and the underwriters are coming in and asking what protocols and what practices you have in place i think as soon as they start to adopt that'll uh, that'll wind up being a a real hard driver uh into uh, into corporations and the end users 
Yeah, I do agree, uh, Sal. I think the you know the cybersecurity uh, insurance stuff that we just don't have the actuarials yet is kind of the issue in that space. Uh, but but slowly they're learning. I, I should say quickly they're learning. And so you know I've seen policy applications that are you know four hundred questions. Right, they look more like the CMMC. <laughs> uh, monitoring uh, documentation, you know, which are, so those are really good. I've seen some that have 12 questions. So, yeah. you know, that, that world still kind of fleshing itself out. And I, I would definitely be wary of the um, exclusions, you know, that are, that are in there. Uh, the people, if com- companies want to rely on, si- on insurance, which I, I think you better get some, but you still better be invested in the hygiene side of the business itself to prevent the breach in the first place. Well, the, the liability job? pieces is going to be tough. That, that's the whole joke with the insurance companies, right? Then they'll, <laughs> they'll insure you for something that's never going to happen, but trying to get insurance for something that may happen, and you know, they, they don't want it, they ain't going to write the policy. But yeah, anyway, yeah, exactly. This has been fascinating. Listen to you, uh, you know, run us through the, the whole process. And it's something that I think, you know, we, we're all in agreement here that the C suite really needs to pay attention to this and take a look at what's coming down the pipe and start to make the planning before they wind up getting the compliance or find themselves out of compliance. And I, I definitely think, uh, you know, follow up in a few months, Andrew, to see how this is uh, all progressing. Like you say, they're trying to gauge the pedal, on, uh, the, the foot on the gas pedal right now to not go so fast that they lose the ability of anybody to comply and then they can't build jets. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. but, on, but on the other hand, you know, they still got to move forward. So how smoothly this works out and how quickly they're able to get the industry to follow the, follow the carrot that they're putting out there, you know, I think will be a, a good bellwether of, 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 of how quickly this uh, makes its way you know, beyond GSA and into the the general construction business on the commercial side. All righty. Mm-hmm. Well, you've been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and me, Sal Lafreury. We're going to ask you to subscribe to the show. Like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to the webpage again, theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Uh, Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform. You can catch us on YouTube. And of course, you can stream it at theriskadvisor.com. So for Jim Henry and myself, we want to, Andrew, we want to thank you once again. And uh, thanks Thanks, for listening. Thanks for being with us. And uh, we hope to see you guys real soon. Thanks again. Bye.